<laughs> Hi everyone. Okay, are we live now? Yes, we are live now. Okay, hey, yeah. So I welcome to Success uh, Journey to Success, uh, the Rebound by Success Peter Asia. Uh, thank God it's Friday. So we hope you have a great weekend and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. So today we have a guest who has spent more than a decade developing leaders and teams through conducting trainings, coaching, and facilitating uh, group processes. So a recipient of several awards and scholarships. So uh, he's none other than Terence. So he graduated even with a Master of Science in Communication Management at SMU, uh, Singapore Management University. And uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology with honors at, uh, from University of Sheffield. Oh my goodness, his, his introduction is really, really long, you know. So um, he is also the CEO of Emergenetics Asia Pacific. So without further ado, let us welcome uh, Terence up on stage uh, live with us. Hi, Hello, this Terence. Yes, <laughs> very uh, long interview. Everyone who is uh, tuning in, I think on your Successpedia uh, Asia's Facebook page and YouTube. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this is the first time I'm going live via a live stream. Most of the time, the webinars tend to be more gated. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, it's an absolute pleasure to be spending the Friday evening with you, Desmond. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's our honor as well. It's our pleasure to actually have you uh, of your status, of, of the things that oh. you have been doing. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you're too kind and you're too kind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So without further ado, maybe you can, uh, I, I, I know I gave a very long introduction, but maybe <laughs> you can, you can um, introduce yourself to our audiences. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, thanks again for uh, having me. Uh, and good evening, everyone. My name is Terence. Uh, I'm the CEO for Emergenetics uh, Asia Pacific. Um, so Emergenetics uh, Asia Pacific is the headquarters for a people and uh, organization development company called Emergenetics International. Uh, and my business partners are based in the uh, US, in Colorado. Um, so we run the Asia Pacific headquarters here based in Singapore. Uh, so predominantly what we do as a business is we uh, help uh, individuals and teams uh, to really understand themselves in terms of their thinking and behavioral preferences um, so that they can really communicate better, collaborate better, so that they can achieve the kind of results that they want to achieve. Uh, I've been running the company uh, as a CEO since 2012, but I was actually certified in using the Emergenetics profile uh, since 2006. Uh, so I've been talking about Emergenetics for my entire life uh, in that sense, but prior to that, uh, you know, I spent about 13 years in the Singapore Navy uh, which gave me the you know the foundation. I, I, I took a lot out of that, so I'm always grateful to to to, to the Navy. Uh, but otherwise, I'm really enjoying uh, you know what I'm doing today, which is uh, really to talk to business leaders, to talk to teams uh, about solving some of the challenges that they, they tend to see at work, right? Uh, which is how do you communicate? How do you collaborate? How do you build a community? Uh, how do you build you know the kind of culture that you want to see uh, within your your company itself? So these are just some of the things that, um, that I do. Uh, and of course, the way to do so would be uh, either through uh, training. So I'm one of the master trainers in the world uh, where I certify other trainers so that they can become uh, certified in the use of the Emergenetics profile. Um, I also do a little bit of coaching with uh, business leaders and team. So do a bit of uh, uh, leadership coaching as well as team level coaching. Um, and as, as you mentioned, I'm also trained uh, and I've been using uh, process facilitation techniques um, to help teams when they come together, when they're, whether they're talking about strategy or you know, reviewing uh, some of the action plans that they have had uh, or charting the way forward. So anything related to strategy and communication or building com community, those are uh, kind of like my, my pet topics. Uh, so I'm really excited to be uh, you know, uh, on air with uh, Desmond uh, today, really just to talk a little bit about um, uh, where are we headed, right? Uh, because we're all in this yeah. uh, unique, yeah. uh, difficult situation. Um, so things are different. So yeah, I'll be I'll be excited to share uh, what I've learned. Uh, I'm also excited to share uh, what are some of the things that um, you know my clients have learned as well uh, with all of you. Right. Wow. So uh, you you mentioned just now that uh, Emergenetics Asia Pacific and that's Emergenetics um, uh, International, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's right. From my understanding, Emergenetics is also a tool. Yeah, so we were just chatting before this, right? That uh, you know, as a as a company, because uh, you know, people people use the name Emergenetics, but uh, it's it's not just the name of the company, but it's actually the name of the psychometric uh, uh, assessment tool. So, so maybe if I can just 
uh, if you if you allow me, uh, Desmond, yeah, uh, I'll sure. just a quick share screen. Uh, okay. Just okay. Who, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the the people are in terms of uh, you know the invention of the tool itself. So coming up on your screen right now, I hope you can see this. Um, yeah. These are the two developers of the uh, psychometric profile called Imogenetics Profile. So Dr. Gail Browning and Dr. Will Weather Williams. So this really happened way back in the 80s, right? So the two of them were really motivated um, by a very simple uh, idea. So the, the question really is, can we have something that is backed by science and data uh, that is easy to use so that we can easily understand people, whether it's at work, or is in life, right? So this is their basic motivation. And so the two of them came together, drafted a, you know, a bunch of questions, uh, went out to test uh, people you know, from 200 to 500 to 1,000 to 5,000, all the way to about 10,000 people before they streamlined the questionnaire uh, to what we have today, which is called the Imogenetics Profile. So the research uh, is really based on studies that were grounded in education, psychology, uh, and neuroscience. So we were talking about names earlier, right, Desmond? Um, mm. When we talk about the word emergenetics, uh, unfortunately, it can be a little bit difficult to pronounce, but it's actually pronounced as emergenetics. Uh, and it's made up of two words. Uh, one word is uh, emerging, and this really refers to coming out from the environment. Uh, the other word is genetics, so really referring to our DNA. So I, I'm not sure, Desmond, you heard uh, you know, uh, about this statement, right? Nature or nurture. Right? So when we think about um, who we are as individuals or how we uh, have habits in the way we like to talk to people or communicate or behave, um, you know, scientists have uh, always been debating whether is this nature or nurture. In other words, are you born this way or are you made this way? So uh, in genetics, I think the, the philosophy really is that we are who we are today in terms of our behavior, in terms of our thinking habits. Um, it, it really is a combination of both the environment that we live in as well as our DNA. Uh, I remember one participant asked me in the workshop, so what is the percentage? Well, I don't know the percentage. I don't, I don't think anybody can put a real percentage to it. But it's, you know, it's, it's suffice to, to know that uh, our habits in thinking, our habits in behavior really come from both uh, our DNA as well as the environment. And that's really the, the meaning of the name epigenetics. So if we were to look at a one-liner to try and explain what exactly is epigenetics, then it really means the patterns of thinking, the patterns mm -hmm. of behaving, that is derived from both our life experiences as well as our genetic blueprint. Now, when we talk about uh, patterns of thinking, the easiest way to think about it really is, what is your habits when it comes to thinking? So when you're trying to process information, Right. So, for example, yep. we are talking about uh, you know the current situation, and oh my goodness, I'm trying to make sense of what is really happening uh, you know around me. I'm trying to process new information. How does your brain actually process that information? What is the the what we you know we use the word pathway, right? Because the brain is made up of a lot of neurons, and the neurons make connections called neural pathways. So, what kind of pathways uh, is your brain preferring to take? The habits. Right, in order for you to really make sense of the world. So this is what we are really talking about. Um, and I think a, a visual says a thousand words, right? So, uh, so what you have in front of you in the screen really are the seven attributes of the Imogenetics Profile. So four of them are thinking, the, the, the four colors, blue, green, red, yellow. And this really represents the four different ways that our brain prefer to think, right? Um, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see the three purple uh, arrows. And these are the three behaviors that Imogenetics Profile measures, okay? So when we talk about the thinking attributes, then it really just means when I'm trying to make sense of the world, uh, do I tend to analyze? In other words, I'm, I'm concerned about data, I'm concerned about facts, you know, I want to know the objectives, or do I prefer to take a structural approach to process information? So structural approach really just means, uh, you know, give me all the practical details, let's do it step by step, uh, you know, the guidelines, the SOPs and so on. Or from the red, do I tend to think in terms of relationships and therefore social, right? Uh, or conceptual meaning, thinking of things from the big picture, the ideas, uh, you know, vision, uh, that that point of view. So a very important point to know right now is uh, we we have all four, right? All of us have four ways of thinking, but what Imogenetics does is to try and tell us which one of the four or which ones of the four 
is our habit, right? So when we are thinking, which one do we tend to use most of the time? Uh, is it analytical, structural, social, or conceptual, or a combination of this? And of course, on the right side for the behavior expressiveness, this really means when we're interacting with people, is my habit, uh, you know, uh, to be quiet, or is my habit more, you know, to be out there, to really socialize and interact, right? Uh, a certain mm -hmm. time when I'm trying to push a point across, so to, to give an example, Desmond, if the, if the two of us are, you know, debating about something, what is the style right. that I tend to use, right? So am I more towards a peacekeeping style or do I come across more as driving the point of us? Okay. And then finally, mm -hmm. flexibility is when there's change uh, in the external environment, do I tend to come across, uh, you know, to be more focused and firm and, uh, 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 you know, or do I tend to be welcoming change? So these are the three behaviors. And again, uh, Emergenetics really help us understand what are our habits when it comes to thinking and what are our habits when it comes to uh, behaving. So that, I hope, gives you a, a little bit of a, a, you know, a snapshot uh, as to what, what, are, you know, what, what is exactly Emergenetics. Uh, and uh, if, if we have a little bit of time, uh, I, I will also show you uh, one slide just for the fun of it, right? So for our yeah. uh, people who are tuning in right now, uh, you know, just do a quick and dirty guess, right? Just make a guess. Uh, which one do you think could be your thinking preference? And of course, the tool itself measures two things, thinking as well. Yeah, but uh, I don't want to go to take up too much time, but this is just a little fun activity, right? So do you right. tend to solve problems uh, through research or through processes or through people or ideas? So read through each of the description. Uh, and of course, this is not the way to do the emergence profile, right? The way to do it really is to go online and take a hundred questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, uh, you know, a little bit of a teaser if you like. So Desmond, you can see the uh, the descriptions, right? Yep. So maybe you can uh, try and make a guess and see which one you, you feel you resonate more with. Um... In terms of thinking, so when we are processing information, which one do you feel uh, speaks more to you? And you can pick more than one. So you tend to, uh, you know, solve but problems. I, I think I'm or... very yellow and red, you know. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and again, there is no right or wrong or which one is better, right? But you will notice that each of the thinking attributes or each of the ways of thinking is quite <laughs> different, right? So we use this a lot to help people understand themselves, right? Because self-awareness is really key, right? And also when we're working in teams, this is very, very powerful because I want to know who are the people that I'm working with and therefore how do they tend to think and behave? So that's when you're making the guess that you likely are conceptual and social in, uh, in thinking, right? Okay, I'm gonna show you what my profile is, right? So this is the big review. Uh, I'm, I'm being vulnerable right here, right? So this is my emergenetics profile. Uh, and okay. of course, I'm going to run into the details of how to actually read it, but uh, I hope you can see there's a lot of blue, uh, yellow and, and red looking at the circle, right? So right. most time when I'm processing information, I tend to think analytically, conceptually, and socially. So what it means is I really prefer to ask a lot of why questions. Like why are we doing this? Uh, and then conceptual would be what is the big picture here? And then social would be in terms of, you know, how do people actually feel about this? Okay, mm. so that is pretty much my, uh, my thinking preferences. Um, and I've already asked permission uh, from Colin, who is my, uh, you know, one of my other business partners. So I'm going to show you his profile. As you can see right here, for the fun of it. So you can see that I have uh, blue, yellow, and red. So these are my preferred way of thinking. Now, Colin, on the other hand, really has a preference for blue, green, and red, right? So okay. yellow is not his preference, and conceptual is not his thinking preference. So as you can see, the two of us are actually quite different. We have similarities, but differences in the way we think. So, uh, you know, uh, this is quite interesting also because when we talk about um, developing people or developing teams, this is an example of two business partners and, and how do we figure out a way to work with one another. So, uh, right. so you know, in early days when we were working together, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would go to Colin and say, hey, Colin, you know, I saw this research and I think it's wonderful. Maybe we should do this. So I would come up with, you know, all these wonderful ideas. I think it's wonderful, right? So I would, I would just bombard him with all these wonderful ideas that I think are wonderful. Yeah. And then Colin would just say, okay, okay, he would start thinking. And then one day, you know, we would sit down and we would say, you know, how do we work better with each other? And then Colin would say, you know, Terence, I've got a question for you. A lot of times you tell me, you know, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this. Um, do you really mean to really do it? And I said, what idea? 
right? Because I had already right. forgotten and I've given him all those ideas. Now, what is really happening is because Colin is using his structural thinking preference and un unknown to me, all the ideas that I've been giving to Colin, mm -hmm. right, really becomes a to-do list for him, right? Because right. Like, thinking preference he's thinking okay if Terence say let's do this okay it means it's important let's go do it so i'm just adding on this to do list but uh, clearly that wasn't my intention because i was more coming from the yellow the ideation right so really just thinking about idea um so knowing how we tend to think and behave allows us to really fine-tune our communication strategy i will give you one more example and then you know i'll have the time to take to you so this is an example of jen uh, again i've sought sort of permission from jen to share this openly right so you can see mm -hmm. that Jen's thinking preference is structural right again looking at the pie right so the green uh for me green is not a preference right so what it means is when i'm thinking the last thing that i would really think about most of the time really is the processes and the details now that doesn't mean i'm not good at it Right? It's just that I tend to think of the big picture, the objectives and the relationships more than I start thinking about the details. Jen is a complete opposite. Now, what I'd like right. to point out too is the fact that if you look at the three behaviors, remember expressiveness, assertiveness, and flexibility, uh, we, we measure this against the population and so we can compare each other. So in short, I am the 95th percentile for all three behaviors. Jen is on the 5th percentile for all three behaviors. So what it right. means is where, where I prefer to be interactive, right? You know, and really be engaging and talk to you and so on. Jen really prefers to be quiet, okay? Uh, where I prefer to drive my point across, Jen prefers to take a more peacekeeping approach to pushing mm -hmm. up. Uh, where I prefer to welcome change, Jen on the other hand really prefers for things to be focused. So we decide on something then you just focus in and do that. So you can see not only from the thinking dimension, but from the behavioral dimension, we are very opposite. Now, if I didn't have Emergenetics profile, I would be driving Jen up the wall a lot, and I'm mm -hmm. quite sure Jen would drive me up the wall a lot, right? Because it's so yep. easy for me to just say, Jen, why is it that you don't understand? You know, uh, I'm just giving you the big picture and so on and so forth. Why do you ask mm. me so many questions? Why are you asking me so many other questions? Um, but actually, Jen is thinking, right? She's thinking a lot of the how questions because clearly I'm not coming up with a lot of answers in that area. So you can see, uh, this is how we use Emergenetics to help two co-workers, two business partners uh, within the team itself to figure out what is the best way to communicate, um, you know, to, to really work better with each other. And finally, just one more thing. Um, we, we also talk a lot about um, culture, building culture in the business, right? building the culture in the team. And this is one of the reports that we have at the team level. So all the people in my company have taken the profile, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And then we generate a group profile. So looking at the group profile, then from a leader point of view, it allows me to figure out, okay, uh, what is the general tendency and therefore what could be our strengths, what could be our blind spots, uh, where we're right. making decisions, are there potential gaps, uh, especially in a crisis situation like this, right? We want to make sure mm -hmm. that we're not just going as per normal, but we really want to be mindful and so on. So reports like this, uh, therefore, are very, very helpful uh, as we talk about building culture, building trust within the team itself. So right. uh, I've taken about uh, 10, 15 minutes or so just to give you an overview uh, <laughs> of what and I hope it's not too much uh, information on a Friday night, but as you can see, it's uh, you know it's something I'm really passionate about. It has helped me personally, so I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's really, very really, very good to, to know um, especially for the viewers and for the viewers who have been uh, staying on all the way and learning, knowing uh, how Emergenetics actually works on a personal basis, on a personal level and on a small team level and even to a full corporate um, business uh, level. Uh, just just curious, I, I don't know whether Quan Xin was inside. Quan Xin actually posted this. So he was asking yellow and green, what is it? Yeah. Okay, so yellow it means conceptual thinking. So again, conceptual thinking means I really prefer to think of the big picture. Uh, I like to ask what ifs questions, right? So for example, hmm, what if we do it this way instead? Uh, same problem, but is there a different way to solve it? You know, that kind of thinking, right? right. So it's more abstract and it's more divergent. Uh, green really means structural thinking. So structural really just means more concrete. Uh, let's take it step by step. Give me the practical details. How are we going to get this done? Mm, okay. mm, right. yeah so yellow and green that's how we explain it i hope that ah. answers 
Yep, I, 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 um, Guan Xin, I hope you are still there. I hope um, we have answered your question on, on that. Yes, but it's really very interesting because you got me, you, you got me very interested to actually get my whole team to actually do it. Uh, as I think you have met some of my team members before yes. and uh, yeah, and during the COVID, we have been, we have been getting more people in, you know, to, to help us, yeah. to, who are interested to write through with us, you know, to start something new, fresh with us. So yeah, I yeah. think it's really wonderful. Um, so uh, moving forward, moving forward, I, I just want to hear from you. I think the viewers will also love to hear from you. What are the impacts, uh, in your opinion, of COVID-19 and the circuit breaker on the nature of work and the workplace itself? Yeah, I think this is a, a, a really big question, you know, and uh, it, it really deserves uh, an in-depth uh, analysis and answer as well. But uh, I'll probably just speak from my own personal experience and I, I'm quite sure there's a lot of viewers out there with a lot of uh, experiences that I can also learn from as well. But um, you know, needless to say, uh, COVID-19 and in Singapore, uh, the circuit breaker measures uh, has really disrupted you know, the way we have always been thinking about work as well as the workplaces. So if we look at the nature of work and the nature of workplaces, uh, in a not too distant past, before COVID actually started, uh, what was work like? Yeah? And what was you know, the workplace like? Right, so we go to work. You know, we, we 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 have a set routine. You know, there's a space that we all come to. I may have my own work desk at the workplace. When I want to have a meeting, I will book a meeting room. Uh, when I want to meet with clients, I will either drive there or take a public transport or get a client to come over to our office space. You know, arrange for uh, a boardroom setting, get a PowerPoint slides ready. So those are the everyday hustle and bustle uh, in a typical office environment. Right, and again. Yeah. Uh, that, that is pretty much how our work has to be, right? Um, so mm. for my company, we were we are we are actually based in one of the WeWork uh, co-working spaces. Um, so so obviously, you know, there's a lot of buzz. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, excitement, a lot of uh, 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 community that's moving around and so on and so forth. You know, but essentially, we have a space that we go to to do work, right? But uh, with COVID. And the circuit breaker suddenly the most fundamental thing which is go to office cannot be done mm -hmm. right? unless you're yep. in essential services and so on so for the rest of us who are not in essential services uh we all are now working from home and in fact for my team we started working from home since doscon orange started i think it was 7th of february um mm. and basically you know because at that point in time we were, we were very concerned with you know how, uh, how serious this uh, COVID-19 is, you know, uh, how easy is it for people to catch it? And we want to um, take care of the team members' uh, safety. And that's why we say, okay, why don't we all work at, work from home and don't go to the office if we can afford not to. So if we think about the nature of work and the workplace, um, COVID-19 as well as the, the circuit breaker measures have allowed us to see what we think was possible or is going to be possible in the future, right? Because we mm -hmm. always talk about industry 4.0, we talk about technology being a disruptor in the future, there's going to be AI and robots. I mean, I, I remember giving some lectures, you know, citing some, uh, some of these research pieces as well. But uh, with COVID-19, it has forced us to drop everything and, you know, literally start from scratch, right? So, you know, no questions asked, everybody work from home, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it was because there are organizations like TAFEP, right, uh, Tripartite uh, Alliance for Fair Employment Practices, which has always been promoting for employers to really think about flexible work arrangements. In other words, can we have staggered working times? Uh, can we allow people to move more uh, remotely, telecommute instead of going to the office, uh, just so that we can be more family friendly when it comes to work and so on. But with Circuit Breaker, suddenly everybody has to work from home, right? So you are jumping from zero all the way to one where actually the whole concept of working from home uh, or, or you know, having flexible working hours has been around for the longest time. It's just that companies right. have been slow in uh, you know, making the changes because there's a lot of concern about privacy, there's a lot of concern about security of data, um, technology, is it ready? Um, so, so I think, uh, if anything, uh, personally I've learned uh, you know, over the last two to three months, just working from home, um, that we are going to go back to uh, a so-called new normal, which is very different from before COVID times, right? Uh, where we are looking at more 
uh, uh, the consumer behavior is going to change because a lot of us, uh, since we're all working from home, uh, we're yep. consuming products and services slightly differently now, right? Uh, services, not so much, right? But obviously, if I need to have a haircut, I still need to physically go to a, a salon or a barber, right? But yes. uh, I'm talking about generally speaking, when people are talking about buying, uh, you know, buying behavior. So um, a lot more delivery, going shopping online, e-commerce and things like that. So so the nature of consumer behavior is changing and, mm-hmm. and it's going to affect work processes, right? Right. Uh, so to give an example, uh, because in Merchandetics, we do a lot of um, physical uh, experiential workshop where we get uh, teams to come together and then go through a, a training together. Um, but because yes. of security, we can't do that. So we have to shift a lot of our training uh, from the experiential one to uh, online. online. So, yeah. so clearly, the way that we're delivering our service, which used to be a training, sending a trainer into a venue to run a training workshop, uh, that is changing, right? So we're now shifting things online. You're still going to get a trainer, but we're using platforms like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and so on to deliver the training. So the nature of mm-hmm. our world is changing. And clearly, the workplace is changing as well, right? Because when we talk about beyond the circuit breaker so you know from second of june hopefully everything goes as planned we get to slowly ease back uh, uh you know into normalcy um but we we can't go back to you know the same kind of uh, work environment as before you know we have to think about segregated work teams uh, people cannot mm-hmm. see each other you still got to wear your mask um so the workplace itself is also going to be changing and i tell i think what is more interesting is i'm hearing a lot of business leaders uh, in some of my um, group chat, right, where they are talking about, do we actually still need a physical office space? Right? <laughs> that, was is- in the new, that was in the news recently as well. Right? The, the and whole of the town have, is, yeah. Right, and a lot of people have invested in, you know, uh, uh, you know, a new laptop, or they set up their own little cozy corner. They've invested into a home office. Now, do you think that they want to still go back to work? And in fact, what was interesting, there was a recent, uh, uh, research done by Singapore Human Resource Institute and uh, Engage Rocket. Um, and they found that eight out of every 10 employees really prefer to work from home beyond mm. the information, right? So if you think about it, there was a period of time where it was a sudden shock to the system. We all had to work from home. We all scrambled. We figured, oh my goodness, well, how are we going to do this? Do I need to bring my computer home and so on? So there was that, that whole uh, shock. And then we had to figure out how to make that work. But now people are slowly getting used to the idea of working from home, right? Making mm-hmm. themselves more comfortable, creating routines, setting out certain boundaries and so on. So we definitely are looking at people going back to the workplace uh, and the workplace is definitely going to be changing. So those I feel uh, are some of the impact that I think we will be seeing uh, from COVID-19 as well as a circuit breaker. Right, right. Uh, viewers, if you have any questions, please feel free to put down on the comments and uh, I... I think Terence will be more than happy to address your questions. Yeah, yeah, I see. So before that, so I just say hello to them. So hi, Fas. Uh, I think she's dialing in from, from Malaysia, uh, and that's oh. Asia, who is, who is our you know fantastic runner that uh, that does a lot of running with for good social causes. Uh, so I'll just uh, say hello to some of these people that I can see their names. Uh. Yes, Teresa. You have Teresa as well. Yes, hi Teresa. Nice meeting you here as well. And, uh, yeah, and. Y- Someone actually said, Serafina, I, I, I don't know whether she's still in here. I hope she's still in here. So while you were sharing, she actually said an in-depth sharing, an eye-opener for her. So yeah, it's... Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is something that we're all still learning. So I don't profess to be an expert in any way. Okay, so that's a big thing. I'm, I'm here to really learn from, uh, from as many of us as well. Yeah. Oh, we have Bernard. Bernard as well. Bernard saying hi. Hi, Bernard. Hi, Bernard. Hello. Yeah. All right. Um. Okay, so before the viewers throw any questions to you, I think I better throw throw one question to you quickly um, off, off our, our prepared questions. So you were saying um, the nature of workplace has changed so much. So what do you think uh, when we move down the road, when how are things different in a way where everyone is in the office, but we are kept like one meter away from each other? That's one. And then during meetings, and then even for team building or or um corporate sessions that we have together you know sometimes abang are they you know we, we go side by side to build the momentum together with all those taken away how how big do you think a, a, that, that that is an impact for for businesses corporate uh, and workplace environment yeah i i think the um the the circuit breaker you know covid i think has 
has shown us that uh, we will need to expect to work very differently than before. Mm. Right? So the way that we're going to be working will be different. So that's an expectation. Now, exactly how I think we are also figuring out. And the reason why I say this is um, even though uh, you know the Singapore government has done a lot to try and you know bring everything back to normalcy, right? Uh, and I think recently they, they talked about you know beyond uh, 2nd of June onwards, we're going to slowly ease back in phases, right? But exactly when or how, we're not quite sure yet, right? But we know that there will be phases for us to go back. Mm -hmm. um, but what is for sure is that uh, chances are we still need to wear masks, for sure, right? Um, the total number of people that you can congregate in the space, that is still a question mark. So is it five people or is it 10 or is it 15? And if so, yes, one meter apart, but you know, uh, uh, how long do we stay in the meeting room? Is it, you know, uh, do we need to keep the windows open? And so on so forth. So I think there's still a lot of questions. Um, yeah. and Oh, rightly so. So we are all still beginning to figure out uh, what going back to work actually means. Um, so, so what will be interesting really is for us to start thinking that, okay, let's just assume uh, that we still need to continue working from home. Maybe some of us can get up to go back um, so that we can begin to put in some planning, uh, you know, to really look at the business processes. So I think from the whole operations point of view, there will be some changes. And I think what's making it difficult is that we don't have certainty. So to give an example, right, uh, we, we run certification programs uh, to, yeah. to certify people in the use of the Imagix profile. And we, we do this for three days, right? Uh, so we ran a, a, a meeting space, um, quite a big space, um, and we have typically about like 10 to 15 people. So now the question within my team is, okay, can we still run that, right? Because it's 10 to yeah. 15 people, right? Uh, and with 15 people, is it just the participants? Do the uh, you know the, the staff do they count? Because if we have two more staff, that's 17, right? So that so if that's the case, do I sell my uh, my program for up to 13 people, and I need to cap at 15, or is the number 10, and therefore I can only sell up to eight? You see what I'm saying? So with yeah. this uncertainty, uh, it's making business uh, decision making a little bit difficult, right? But I think this is a challenge not just faced by us. We are not unique. I think all the other business owners are facing very similar challenges or even worse, right? So I think it's the uncertainty in terms of what does going back to work look like that mm. makes it more uh, difficult for us to nail. So, so that would be, uh, uh, I feel, uh, you know, what, what is really happening for a lot of business leaders that I'm talking to, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of scenario plan, planning, right? So uh, yep. if, if the government says we can have 10 people, then this is what we do. If the government says, okay, we can have 20 people, okay, good, then we can do this. But the government yep. says we can have 50 people, then we can do this. So, uh, you know, we never thought that just the number of people who can gather in a space will make such a big difference in terms of your business making decision. And this is just one example, right? Um, mm. The other thing that you talk about, like in terms of team building, how does that work, right? So clearly I can't get 30 people to squeeze into a room now, right? I mean, I can't do that on the second day. You know, you know, when can I go back? When can we run all these sessions again? I said, well, uh, you know, we, we, you can't, we, we, we don't have an answer for that. Um, and even if we, we, we can, even if we are able to get back together, uh, if you have to do team building one meter apart, uh, mm -hmm. well, clearly the activities have to be quite different, right? So, so again, uh, we don't have all the answers, but we will have a lot more questions. But I think uh, what is really important is to really continue to ask questions, not just of other people, but of ourselves. Brainstorm, mm -hmm. because then we can really tap on the brilliance of the different people within the team itself to really think, okay, we cannot assume that we can go back to normal. We need to yeah. almost dream up what a new normal could look like. What does a new normal look like for team building? What does a new normal look like for a normal business meeting? What does the new normal look like for our certification program and so on? So this is what I'm talking about, like brainstorming, you know, doing a scenario planning. And right, it, right, it's right. tiring, right? Because how nice if people can just tell you, this is what it's going to be, then you just have to plan one scenario, right? But uh, because we don't know, so you do need to spend a lot of effort and time to really think about uh, the different scenarios. And so, so that will be, uh, you know, what I think uh, would be uh, occupying the, the head space of a lot of business leaders today. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hey, um, you want to say hi to, uh, we, have, we have Priscilla with us. Did, did we say hi to her just now? Hello. I'll have Priscilla. Hi. Hi, Priscilla. Just a yeah. quick shot. 
Priscilla is with uh, Community Chest, uh, and uh, and they're doing fantastic work with the Courage Fund and the Invictus Fund, and uh, really supporting so many different charities out there. So thanks for joining us, Priscilla. I know you had a long day as well. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> yes, uh, and Wendy, Wendy Hobson. Yes, Wendy. Wendy, it's uh, from all the way from Sheffield. So I got to know Wendy through my university. That was like, oh my God, uh, 20 over years ago. I shan't say it too loudly. But uh, yes, <laughs> thanks for tuning in all the way from the UK. Right. Okay. Yes. So um, yeah, I think I think what what you have mentioned just now um really answers to to one of the questions that we have we have been preparing. So like, what is the new norm for for um businesses for corporates for workplaces? Yeah, but how about the growth? If we talk about growth of an individual and we talk about uh, corporate development practices rather than than um work practices, or we talk about development practices, yeah. what do you think is the new norm? Yeah, so uh, I I feel that we, we, you know we've been talking about changes, right? But maybe we should yeah. talk about what doesn't change. Um, I feel what does change is the fact that we all need to continue learning, right? We all need to continue growing. Um, so th those are few are fundamental truths, right? We still need to continue to learn. It's just that the mode of learning, the platforms and all that will be changing. Um, the, the, the way to really look at personal growth, right? For me, I always look at it from three areas, right? Uh, attitudes, uh, knowledge, as well as skill sets, okay? So attitude can be best uh, summed up in terms of mindsets. So, so today we are in the current situation uh, what is my attitude towards it? And, and, and again, uh, a lot of people are suffering. Um, they, you know, uh, some, of, some, some of them are actually worried about how do I put food on the table? So it's not something to, to be trivialized, right? Uh, mm. But regardless of our circumstances, and we are all different, right? So um, how do I see my current situation? So what is the mindset that I, that I need to have? Or what is the mindset that I want to train myself to have? Uh, what is the kind of attitude that I have for the future? Is it going to be negative? I mean, am I a pessimist and therefore I see that everything's going to be very bleak and it's down here from here? Or can I try and find a silver lining in the cloud even though it's a storm, right? Uh, but mm -hmm. can I try to really find a silver lining in a, in, a, in, a, in a storm in the clouds as well? So that's really coming from an attitude point of view. Then the, the other two part is knowledge and skill sets, right? Um, I think COVID-19 and certain uh, uh, breaker measures have shown that we there's a lot of knowledge gaps right um, so just very simply put um, you know how do i use zoom right how do i get into a meeting right so knowledge uh, even knowledge in terms of uh, you know how do i communicate with uh, different people how do i uh, collaborate online how do i work better uh, uh, remotely what are some best practices so there's a lot of knowledge um, that we tend to ignore in the past because we have always been very focused on uh, you know the work in front of us but because of circuit breaker, we have slowed down a little bit. And, you know, uh, it's time for us to start looking at what are some knowledge gaps that we need to plug. So that doesn't change, right? Before COVID-19, it's the same thing. It's just that right now we're looking at differently. And then finally, we're looking at skill sets. So um, some skill sets uh, uh, I feel are evergreen, right? Communication. Doesn't matter whether there's COVID or no COVID or whether you're going to old normal or new normal. We need to communicate, right? So do I have the skills? Uh, to communicate with people who think differently from me or behave differently from me, right? Um, right, right. Over the, you know, in, in this period of time, especially we've seen the power of collaboration. So do we have the skills to actually collaborate, right? Collaborate with uh, my co-workers, right? And especially collaborating through remote work platforms, right? Like over Zoom mm. or something, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are certain evergreens that I feel don't change even with COVID-19 and even going into the new normal, learning, right? We need to continue to learn. Um, and then obviously also fine-tuning our attitudes, plugging the knowledge gap, and also looking at increasing our skill sets. Uh, some of the evergreen skills like your communication, collaboration skill sets. So those are the things that I feel uh, wouldn't change. Uh, it's just that things, uh, you know, the way to do it would be different. Right. I think what whatever you have said just now really answers to what um Asiel have asked. She was just asking, so what skill sets we need? And then you were you, you were just going on uh, uh with with the few sets of skills that 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 we we, we need, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh Asiel, did Terence answer your question? I hope I answered your question. <laughs> uh, we, 
Uh, oh, we have someone saying hi to us, not to us. Okay, but anyway, hi. Uh, how do you pronounce? Uh, Ed, Eli, Eliu, Eliu. Okay. Yeah. Um, Asel said no boss. I I don't. <laughs> he said specifics yeah. needed. Oh my goodness. You yeah, got to yeah. arrange for Zoom session, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, maybe we, we can just talk about a few skill sets, right? So coming from uh, maybe wear two hats, right? So uh, if I'm an individual contributor within a team, right? Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an employee, I'm a professional PMET working in a team setting. Then uh, the important skill sets that really is in terms of communication, right? So how do I communicate uh, with my coworkers? How do I communicate my ideas, right? Because, you know, there's some ideas that I have. How do I actually present that across? How do I communicate that? So I think communication is a broad topic. Um, but if you want to bring it down to the fundamentals, then really is how do you communicate with your coworkers? Because if you can't even communicate with your coworkers, uh, you know, it, you're, it, it, somewhere along the line, there's going to be miscommunication. Uh, things are going to fall apart. So if, if I were to strip right down to the most basic thing, then I think communication with... Uh, co-workers is really important. So that's one skill, right? Communicating with your co-workers. The second one is collaboration skill. Now, I want to say a little bit about collaboration. I've done some research in, um, and, and there are many ways to define collaboration. One of the definitions that I really like um, about collaboration really is that for collaboration to take place, there must be a shared uh, goal or shared objective, right? Because without a shared or common goal, uh, what you have is likely just cooperation or coordination. Okay, so collaboration really means coming together and creating something even more than just one plus one equals to two. So one plus one is more than equals to two, right? So having, um, a, having a shared goal and... Yeah, so having shared goal or a shared vision. Shared vision, right. Shared vision. So that's really important because otherwise I'm just coordinating with you, right? Um, but if you truly want to collaborate, then I'm going to bring my resources, my energy, my thoughts. You are going to do the same. Right, but the two of us need to have very clear goals and objectives, right? And it must be shared. So the two of us need to share that. Okay. So with this in mind, uh, that's how we can actually train uh, collaboration. And I think it's a skill um, that is uh, all the more required today because we're moving at such a fast pace, um, and you know, innovation, creativity, a lot of these um, at the workplace. That's what we're seeing, right? If you want to increase productivity, you want to increase innovation, increase creativity. Uh, within a team setting, then you need to teach the people how to collaborate, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that is another skill um, to, to really look at. Um, and the next the next uh, skill that I would uh, recommend is also thinking about community building skills, right? So more and more, uh, we are beginning to realize that we are all human beings that need connection. And once mm -hmm. we have human connections, we are able to tap on the resources that are finite, right? So resources are limited. So I have a limited amount of resource. You have limited amount of resource. It's only when I am able to tap on your resource and you're able to tap on mine that we can really do something bigger than what my resources are. So the idea of community is not new, uh, but I think it's getting more and more important in today's uh, workplace. So how do you build a community within your workspace, but not just that, how do you build a community with your audience, right? So like, uh, like that's the, what you're doing right now is you're building a community, right? Because you're, you're creating this webinar that is, you know, you're putting a lot of effort to create this, uh, making it available for people so that they can all learn from each other so I can learn as well. Um, but what you're really hoping to do is really building that community. And I think we are really living in such a fantastic age where social media is on our, on our side, right? Um, and honestly speaking, you know, uh, we, we don't have to worry about having to speak perfect uh, English or whichever other languages, right? Um, you, you, you really just need to be very passionate about a certain topic, you know, be familiar with using a smartphone, uh, you know, some basic editing skills, and there you go, you have your own YouTube channel, uh, you know, you can do um, uh, wonders, right? But at the heart of what you're trying to do really is building a community. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that is a skill that is overlooked. How do you actually build a community? So starting with yourself, how, you know, uh, for you to build a community around yourself, uh, uh, what kind of person do you need to be, right? How do you form human connections? How do you be in service of other people? How do you make a difference such that the community can be inspired and therefore, you know, they bring on more and more people and therefore it goes that way. So three skills that I think 
um, would see there are evergreen skills, but even more important, moving forward, especially when we are working remotely, communication, collaboration, as well as building a community, so community building skills. So I hope that right. answers uh, Wow, I, <laughs> I think I think he wants more. You know, he wants more. Yeah, so I think How we have. I conversation <laughs> otherwise we don't yeah we need to have a private conversation you no know? right after this maybe you know? uh, yeah so it's like in the absence of my boss not valuing not valuing them stuff like this yeah um yeah i think so do you want to take this question because i think it's quite interesting right um, um and and this is the work that we do a lot and that's the reason why you know we think it's really important that um business owners and business leaders so if you are in this uh webinar at this present moment that this message really goes out to you right because i'm playing the role of a team leader so i'm a business owner so i, I i'm a leader of my own team um a lot of things uh you know uh, uh really from the top so i need to set an example right so if i really think that as a company you know uh we, we need to behave in a certain way then i need to be that way i need to i need to model that behavior so Asil's point of you know like in the absence of my boss not valuing them how do i you know practice this then i think it is hard right so Asil, i want to recognize that it's going to be difficult if your boss doesn't appreciate uh all these things that you're talking about but in the end I, I think it's really down to yourself as well right because just because your boss doesn't appreciate you uh it should not stop you from growing as an individual it just shouldn't stop you from still you know, contributing to your co co-workers, uh, you know, being mm -hmm. uh, kind to them, being respectful, you know, uh, supporting them, helping them, extending your resources. Because at the end of the day, what you are really doing is also building that relationship that may go beyond just employment. So always remember, right, it's beyond work. So it's not just about work. Life is so much bigger, um, you know, uh, by, by a stroke of luck or providence or whatever you call it. Uh, you know, we come together to form a team, we come together to be working in the same company, we work, in, work for a certain boss, uh, but that relationship that we build at work, uh, you know, think about it can actually go beyond just that workplace as well. So I would definitely encourage, um, you know, people like ourselves who may feel that they are not being appreciated uh, at the workplace to please don't give up, but really to just continue to grow personally, take charge of your own learning. Uh, um, there should be no reason why uh, you are not growing and you know uh, um, practicing some of the skills that i've talked about yeah, yeah. how uh Asel, does that answer <laughs> straight to you <laughs> yeah. it's it okay I mean, conversation yeah but i mean uh, for for all the viewers if you do have questions please feel free like like what Asel is doing you know just just throw, throw in the questions you know i think we have we have time tonight yes um okay all right so uh yeah so okay next next question that i want to want to um put up on the table will be now what should companies and individuals do to prepare have we i think you kind of answered this question right yeah uh maybe i can uh you know be a little bit more structured in um, in answering this question because if you talk about preparing ourselves for the new normal i think uh, first I, I need to start by saying what is considered a new normal so different people will define it differently right uh, yes. Yes. We are already in a new normal, right? We are already in a new normal because to me, there's only the immediate past, which is before COVID, that we make comparison to, right? So very mm. clearly, for me, I am already in a new normal. But obviously, this new normal is evolving, right? Uh, after the circuit breaker is over, when we go through phase one, hopefully end up with phase two, and then finally ending into phase three, which is our, our safe nation. Um, the the definition of new normal will be evolving all the time. So I don't think it's a fixed definition. So that to me is the first uh, first thing to really define, right? So in other words, in my mind, I'm already in a new normal, but this new normal is going to change. So we're not settling, this is not it, right? So that's the right. first thing to really think about. Now, uh, to answer the question of what should companies uh, or individuals do, um, perhaps I can share some lessons, right? That, um, that, that I had over the last couple of months together with my team uh, you know, and, and, and hopefully with that, we can think about uh, giving some suggestions about what companies and individual, individuals can do, right? So uh, from, from a team perspective, uh, I think um, having clarity and purpose, clarity of the purpose, right? So having clarity and knowing the purpose of the business or the purpose of my work, that is very important, especially uh, during the crisis. It made it even clearer for us, right? 
Um, so I would say moving forward, it's important to know what is your business about or what is your work about? How are you contributing to the bigger picture of the company? If I'm an employer, I'm employee, for example, mm. if I'm a business leader, then I need to be very clear. What's my purpose of the business, right? Um, I, I always like to uh, say this to some of the business leaders that I talk to, right, which is what gives you the license to operate? Right? Because all businesses want to make money, that's for sure. And it's, it's okay, right? But then the question is, what, what gives you the license to still exist? Right? So that purpose and you know, the clarity of the purpose is so important. So you need to know what is the objective and the purpose of your business being in existence. So it's not just about you uh, making money for your own uh, stakeholders, right? That is uh, for sure. But it's important to know your purpose and to be very clear with that. Um, so I think that applies not just for the business leaders, but it's also for the uh, employees as well. The second thing that um, I think would be important really would be um, to really have a need for some kind of a playbook, right? And in this particular case, uh, you know, do you have a, a playbook for crisis, right? Um, and again, crisis management is a topic that has been around for the longest time. Um, it's just that suddenly all the businesses are thrown into a situation where you need to react um, and that's where people are caught, you know, they, they're, they're literally caught by surprise. So I think moving forward, it's important to not assume that business will always be the way it is, right? Mm. That business will change and therefore it's important to think about having some kind of like a playbook. Um, you know, when I say playbook, it really just means the scenario planning, right? So what happens in a crisis, what do you do? Uh, you know, you may want to define certain frameworks, protocols, your SOPs, uh, or even think about business processes. So, like within my team, uh, one of my team members is actually literally studying, uh, you know, what we are doing as a business, um, and then looking at our business protocols and business processes to see how we can map that and how we can actually make changes to that, right? And put it into our playbook. Okay. So the first one I talked about was the clarity of purpose. The second one is having a playbook. Uh, your framework and so on. Um, the third one really is to really think about how are you engaging uh, your team? How are you engaging your coworkers, right? Uh, because moving forward, uh, if this is already the new normal and again, the new normal may change, um, we, unless you are a business that don't work with any human beings, right? Then having, uh, you know, uh, the, the relationship with individuals, uh, the, you know, how are you nurturing that relationship? How are you growing the people? Um, those kind of conversations are very important. So within the team, before COVID, we already had this practice for many years. So one of the things that we do is actually peer coaching, right? Peer mm. coaching just means uh, even the most junior person in my team can be my coach. And even though I'm the CEO of the company, doesn't matter, right? There's no ass about that. But somebody who is very junior in my team can be my coach, right? So we coach one another. Um, and we found that this is something very powerful that uh, moving forward into the new normal, I think it's even more important, right? right? How do you coach each other to make sure that we bring awareness to each other, uh, you know, to, to really grow the individual and grow the team. So investing in the people, growing them, creating greater self-awareness, uh, fine-tuning the way they work each other. I think that's important. Um, mm. and the, the fourth point that I'll just quickly make uh, whether you're a business owner, a uh, business leader, or you're an individual contributor, really is to think about the vision, uh, your own personal vision. Where, where are we going, right? Uh, what is the vision of the future that we want to create? Um, and somebody once said, right, don't waste a good crisis. So we are in crisis right now, um, but it, are there certain opportunities uh, that we can think about seizing? And therefore, uh, what can we do about that, right? Uh, what is the vision of the future that I want to create? or the team wants to create, or the business wants to create. So once we're clear about that vision, then it gives us a certain sense of direction. It gives us a certain sense of hope and inspiration uh, for us to move forward as well, right? So four things, right? Clarity of purpose of your business. What are you here to do, right? Uh, and then having a playbook, so looking at your processes, looking at your frameworks, your SOPs, uh, your businesses, and so on. Uh, and then focusing on the people and the team, right? Making sure you're building the connections. Uh, and then finally, be very clear about where's the vision, what's the future that you're uh, moving towards. So those are the four things that I would uh, imagine, uh, you know, businesses as well as individuals to really think about, even at a personal level. Right, right. I think I think those are really great for the four four points that you have you have mentioned. Um, Ideal Ideal has uh, this question. 
uh, yeah. there, there is a huge number of industry observers worldwide who are saying that life after COVID-19 is about adapting to a new norm, which we just uh, uh, spoke about and discussed about the new norm. And uh, pre-COVID-19 business practices are no longer relevant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so so uh, uh, I, I would say that I'm one of the people in that group who believe that life after COVID-19 will be different, uh, as I've already mentioned in many ways, right? Um, but I would say that, um, you know, the pre-COVID business practices are no longer relevant. I think that could be a bit strong a statement. Uh, I think that's a little bit too absolute. I, I, I would say that there will be changes um, in the way we conduct business, in the way that we practice uh, you know, certain things uh, at work and so on and so forth. But to say that, uh, you know, pre, pre-COVID-19 pre business practices are no longer relevant, I think that becomes too much of an uh, absolute statement. I think there will be something that will be different, some things that will change. To give an example, right? Um, right now, during uh, the COVID situation, uh, clearly we can't uh, go back to the office, right? So a lot of uh, administrative paperwork, uh, is halted, right? So if you think about it, before COVID-19, if you want to sign a contract, what do you do? You go back to the office, you put a stamp, you sign, you you get a dispatch and you, you send it out. But in today's context, you can't really do that, right? So some of our, uh, you know, some of, some of the business leaders that I, I've spoken to who run uh, recruitment agencies, for example, um, mm-hmm. their processes have been disrupted, right? So think about it, right? A HR manager who used to process applications, they're not in the office. They, they, they cannot receive hard copies, right, anymore because you're, you're not in the office and you mail to the, the office. So there are some business practices which are no longer relevant because what they've done is digitalized, right? So rather than to go via the hard copy paper kind of a method, uh, they have all switched to digitalization. So, so you're absolutely right. There will be some practices that are no longer relevant, but there will always be certain things that will still be relevant. Uh, so for example, business... Um, building relationship, uh, kind of, uh, uh, business relationship building kind of uh, activities like networking sessions. Uh, I think businesses will still want to do that uh, because, you know, in some cultures that face-to-face interaction still cannot be replaced by just a good call. You know, I, I don't think someone is just going to, you know, buy a million dollar, you know, uh, pro- product, you know, if we have not actually met face-to-face, right? So, um, so I would say that, but you know, uh, this is a, a good time for a lot of uh, businesses uh, and leaders to really think about what are the, some pro- processes that they can streamline, right? What can you digitalize? What can you automate? But I don't think we will go to the extent that we will drop everything that you have done before. Mm, right. So, uh, ideal. I hope um, Terence have answered your your questions. Speaking on his opinion, yes. Uh, Asiao has a. Uh, we, we have time, right? Sorry, I don't even know how much time we we, we are supposed to have. But I'm quite okay to continue from here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so basically, we can run on until we, we come to the <laughs> end. And the happy. <laughs> I think I think we, this is a very interesting question that I feel I feel we should take, uh, or maybe you should be taking. Right. Uh, what advice would you give to? Uh, I, I don't know what's that. Su, su, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Japanese restaurant, right? Uh, run by Anna. Uh, I, I, I would say Anna is doing a lot of wonderful things uh, in terms of innovation. In fact, I just uh, recently um, hosted a webinar and Anna was uh, uh, you know, one, one of the panelists. Um, so she did share about how um, an FMB outlet, her FMB outlet uh, mm-hmm. is actually affected because of the COVID. Clearly, right? We cannot go for dining and so on. So they did do a few innovative uh, actions, right? So, for example, to look at uh, delivery, for example, uh, yep. you know, before it was purely just dining, right? So I think, um, I, I, I don't think I'm in the best position to give any advice uh, to, to Anna simply because I'm not in the F&B business. Uh, but I would imagine that we would share very similar uh, concerns, right, in terms of how does the future look like? Um, and I will still go back to the few points, right? So what is the purpose of, you know, Suta. And if Suta's, Singapore's, uh, you know, objective is to bring the best of Japanese cuisine, you know, to, to, to Singaporean taste buds, then uh, are there ways to carry that out instead of just thinking about, in, you know, uh, in-restaurant, on-site dining as an option, right? Can there be other ways to do so? So I think once we're clear about the business, 
uh, you know, uh, and, and, and we look at the playbook, we look at your, your operations and say, are there ways to innovate, right? Um, so I think Anna has done quite a lot of things, so including things like your online delivery and so on and so forth. Um, and, and once we start thinking about also the people, right? So how do we make sure that we really take care uh, of the people within the company, uh, you know, continue to invest in them, continue to support their growth, uh, and also to make sure that they are working well together, they're communicating well together, uh, and then painting the vision, right? So maybe this is a good opportunity also for Anna to think, could Suta Singapore be very different from Suta somewhere else, right? Uh, is there scope and uh, space for, for a new vision to come in? And, uh, and clearly, you know, people like Anna and, and her team will be able to come up with brilliant ideas um, to really think about what the future could look like for them. Um, and of course, they will then have to do their own cost uh, analysis to figure out what makes sense uh, for them to, to move forward. But I think the same advice will go with all of us, right? Um, we're, we're all affected. Um, so rather than just to say, okay, let's just wait for things to tide over so that we can go back to the old normal. Can we already assume this is the new normal and therefore what is the vision moving forward? What can we, uh, how do we make use of this crisis in the best way possible so that we are innovating, we are trying something different, uh, you know, just to make sure that we continue to do what we came up to do in the first place. So meeting our purpose and objectives. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Terence. Yeah, so um, which, which brings me to a point that, that I've been wondering as well. Um, yeah, uh, before we go, go to the next question where we, we talk about the lessons learned that can help business leaders and individuals. Um, we, 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 we mentioned about new norm, the new norm, but when I had this series, it was really about the rebound. So is the new norm the rebound? Are we rebounding? Are we having an economy rebound now? Are we in the process of it, even during this phase? Yeah. So, so clearly, I am a disruptor of your series, right? Because you had a, you know, a particular editorial direction that you want to take with the series, and then I come. Sorry, huh? I disagree. About <laughs> 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 the idea of rebound, right? So, I, I was reflecting on your topic of the, you know, the the meaning of rebound, and and like mm. I said, right. Um, I feel that um, where we are right now is already the new normal, but this mm. idea of normal is still in the flux. So it's not settled, right? Um, and, and, and it will change, right? And the speed of change is getting faster and faster, right? Simply because, you know, it, we've been always talking about Industry 4.0 and we've been talking about how the old normal will be disrupted, but uh, mm -hmm. we would thought that the disruptor is technology. In other words, technology is going to come and change the way people work, change the workplace, you know, automation, digitalization, and all that. But actually, we are already in a new normal, but the, the disruptor is not the technology, but the, the disruptor right. is COVID-19, right? So to talk about rebound, in my mind, the way I would define it, and again, you know, I, I welcome other differing views, right? But the way I look at it would be, um, there is a time before COVID, and there's a time after COVID. Right. Mm. So, so when we are in COVID, uh, uh, the circuit breaker measures at this point in time, the way I look at it is we are already in a new normal, right? And we are actually beginning to get used to the new normal, believe it or not. Right. Yes. We are really beginning to get used to working from home. I know some of my team members uh, at the very beginning, they were really struggling because they had young kids at home. So how do you maintain a professional image, you know, trying to do a meeting and then your child is running across or, you know, you're keeping an eye on the, on the child making sure they don't fall over the chair or something. So it took a little bit of getting used to, but I would say that majority of us are beginning to get used to working from home, right? Uh, and again, I'm, I'm saying this with caution because I know there are some people out there who really absolutely hate working from home and cannot wait for to go back, right? But again, there are others of, you know, who are already beginning to feel quite accustomed to doing so. So we are already in a new normal. Um, so when we talk about the rebound, in my mind, it's really a whole, you know, it's kind of like where we're just easing into a, a, a different stage, right? So um, after the circuit breaker, I think the government is talking about three phases, right? Yes. Um, so I would say that uh, in, in my mind, the rebound, at, at, at the way you put it, uh, doesn't exist, right? Because we are already in the new normal. We are mm -hmm. already bounding to that extent. It's just that when we go into phase one, it's going to look slightly different. We're going to get used to that. And then right. we're going to go to phase two and we're going to try and get used to that again. So there isn't going to be a, a, a point where we say, okay, we're done with crisis in that sense. And now we are rebounding, right? Um, mm. Because it assumes that there will be 
almost a settled stage uh, of a new normal. And, and I feel that the new normal is it, it's, it's always going to be in the flux. Yeah, so that's my definition of the uh, rebounding. <laughs> right. But, but if we look at the economy now, if, if, uh, we, we look at even retails, some of the retails that are badly, badly affected. Yes. And uh, even even for um, businesses that have been pouring in money to start an e-commerce web on their own, uh, whether it be a third party e-commerce uh, or, or so, you know, um, all, all in what, what they are trying to prepare is like what you said, preparing for a new norm. Yes. But are, are they not trying to prepare for the economy to bounce back where, where people have more spending power? To, to start to buy and then that's where the economy will actually pick up yeah so i think when we talk about the, the retail sector and again uh, i have friends who, who who run retail outlets right and uh, and a lot of them are suffering uh, because you know rental it's it's, it's killing them uh, there's no one buying anything their shops are closed how, how can you do business when your shop which is your main mode of operation is closed mm. uh, so clearly uh, there's a difference between i'm hoping that there will be customers with spending power to buy from me so that is what i'm hoping versus my expectations of the way i do business right so when you talk about like going e-commerce and so so forth then that's really just figuring out the way i do business so in other words maybe in the past i have a, a bread and butter store right so it's a, a motor a brick and mortar store so i'm just uh, having a, a storefront and then i'm selling to customers that way so that's my main mode of business uh, delivery um, and then there could be other ways, meaning let's do online using e-commerce uh, uh, e and so on. So that's really just the different ways of selling. But that is not the same as do I have customers buying my product? And do I have customers who are willing to spend on my product? So I think that challenge is quite separate from whether I set up a shop or I set it up online. Uh, I think clearly for all business owners, we want to see um, the spending come back again. Right, uh, especially yep. Yep. Others, uh, they definitely want customers to go back to the so-called old normal, uh, where mm. people are able to buy and so so forth. Um, but uh, uh, that is quite different from them deciding whether they should set up an e-commerce or not. But I think what is happening right now for those retailers are, that are able to, uh, they are beginning to realize uh, that actually going to e-commerce is not so difficult for some of them. Um, yep. And they are already embracing it, so that because they have no choice, right? They need to keep the business going, so they they hopped onto e-commerce. But before that, there was a lot of, um, you know, inertia. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of concern. Um, but now that everybody has no choice, you know, uh, consumers are all stuck at home. There's no way that they can come forward. Um, you know, some of them are beginning to realize, hey, actually going to e-commerce can uh, can be quite straightforward. It's not as challenging so i would imagine that retailers are still going to have the same problem uh, uh in a new normal which is how do i encourage my consumer to come and buy my product right so the the, the usual uh, conversations about how do i maintain my competitive advantage against other retailers selling the same kind of products i think those things are still the same how do i ensure that uh, the culture within my team uh you know is there so that you know we're working productively together so those things will still remain the same um, but that doesn't remove the fact that uh, you know all retailers are hoping that consumers will go back to the usual uh, you know uh, buying uh, kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm still trying to 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 get you to to have that rebound mentality. Okay. But then uh, <laughs> we take that offline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Um. Now my last question to you for tonight. Um. Before any viewers throw in any more questions would be, um, what are some lessons learned that can help business leaders and individuals uh, who are out there? Mm. I think I, I, I started earlier um, sharing a little bit of the, the kind of um, lessons that we have learned uh, as, as, as a company as well, right? So um, I, I would say that uh, this period of time has, uh, has made certain things even more uh, you know, highlighted the importance of some of these things, right? Uh, you know, because for, you know, since 2012, I've been talking about developing people every other day. So it, it became almost like a, so such a boring topic to me anymore, right? Because I keep saying the same thing, right? But mm -hmm. it was this, this crisis itself that I begin to realize that actually uh, it is so important, right? Knowing yourself, 
um, it's, it's really, really important. So to, to give an example, right, uh, when we started working from home and then we now had to transit to, you know, re remote working uh, and so on and so forth, um, we, it, it became clearer to us that we needed to really understand how to work with each other. So for example, right, if you have a child at home, uh, you may not be able to come online at the time that I can come online, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we coordinate the timings? How do we, um, you know, be more understanding, be more respectful of each other's uh, personal time? Uh, how do we draw boundaries? Uh, you know, how do you prefer to communicate? How do I prefer to communicate? Uh, so these are things that are becoming more um, uh, important and was highlighted for uh, during this period of time for us to really pay attention to. So really knowing myself, uh, what are my own habits, right? Uh, how, how do I uh, prefer to get things done? Um, and also because we are now working remotely, then there is also that question of uh, uh, clarity in the communication process, right? So for example, if I were to send something over Slack, uh, because we are not physically present, right? It's a bit difficult to clarify. So I need to, can we pick up the phone and talk instead of just typing away? So I think these are some uh, lessons uh, that I've learned in terms of how do I communicate? So in short, right? In the area of communication, then it's not just about the what, right? What you communicate, but it's how do you communicate, um, where you communicate. So do I communicate over Slack? Uh, do I communicate over WhatsApp, right? Uh, do I communicate over email? Or should I pick up the phone and call you? So how, right? The, 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 the where, where's the platform to do it? So, mm. so those are the key things to really think about, right? So not just what you communicate, but how, uh, and where to communicate. And also one important point, when do you communicate? So within the team itself, uh, we have drawn boundaries, right? Because now that you're working from home, it's very easy for you to blur the lines between your private personal time and your office time. Uh, previously, when we are working in the office space, it's easy, right? Because you know, at a certain time, we leave the office, so we transit into our personal space. But now that you're at home, it's really easy for you to literally either be working around the clock uh, or if you have certain, you know, uh, uh, people that don't don't uh, respect the boundaries, then it, it can be very stressful. So mm -hmm. when you communicate becomes important as well. So within the team itself, uh, we make it a point that after six o'clock, we don't WhatsApp each other. And if there's something that we want to talk about work, we use Slack, right? Because then the individuals can choose to silence that notification and we respect that. Um, right. And Definitely, we don't talk about work over the weekends unless it's like really, really important. In that case, we will pick up the phone and call and people understand that. But so I think it's important to set that boundary, uh, you know, talk about when do you actually communicate. So that's really just one area of our communication that has worked for us, right? Um, I, I talked a little bit about the self-awareness piece. I think, I think that's important. Um, I think the, 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 the other piece really is uh, from, from a business owner point of view, then it's really about how do you actually build the culture within a team? Um, and this is something that we have invested a lot of time uh, you know, and effort in. And I think it's so important, especially right now when everyone is working uh, you know, apart, working from different places and so on and so forth. So what we do uh, as a team is uh, we do a lot of uh, you know, uh, connections, right? So one-to-one -one connections, checking in with one another. Uh, we do a lot of uh, online team building, if you like. Like uh, every Friday, we would have uh, uh, what we call a we eat and learn. Uh, like literally five o'clock, like uh, just a couple of hours ago, one of my uh, team members uh, led us all to uh, in a in a chocolate making class, right? So we set up my laptop. All of us have our own separate ingredients. Of course, it's a bit hard to get uh, cocoa powder and all that. I've never done chocolate in my life, but it is a way of us to do things that is not work related, right? So I think that that is important as well. So when we talk about um, um, you know, workplace relationships. Uh, it, it, mm. it, it's a constant investment of time and effort and energy, um, and then we need to continually build that, um, and also find ways uh, to build that relationship that is not about work, right? Um, a, a phrase that uh, that I have learned uh, some time ago, uh, you know, uh, is we are called human beings, not human doings, right? So mm. really. Who are you being, uh, you know, as a person, you know, so do I see my co my, my co-workers, my team members as individuals, you know, so that I can care for them and so on so forth, or do I just look at them as just pure colleagues uh, in, an ex in, in a sense? So how do you build that relationship? Uh, I think that, that is uh, important. So building the workplace culture uh, will be important. So those are the three broad areas. So really talking about the self, 
uh, self-awareness piece, building the individual uh, you know, uh, in terms of your um, knowledge, your skills, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, building the team, uh, and then finally building the culture of, uh, of the team itself. Mm, right. Well, okay. I think I think that's that's really um, quite to to me is uh, is in depth. It's good. It's good. Yeah. So oh, uh, it's Friday evening. <laughs> <laughs> it is Friday evening, right? So I feel like, oh my god, is this getting heavier? Should we be talking about something? <laughs> <laughs> so, so fast is very supportive. I mean, she she says um uh, humans human beings more than human doings. So she I think she loves. I I, I love it as well. Human yeah. So I think we sometimes forget. As I think COVID nineteen has taught us that, um, you know, the because of social distancing, right? That's the most important thing, right? Because we are all stuck at home in our own little realities. But it's because we are so far apart from each other that we begin to realize. Hey, hang on a minute. There's something that I'm actually missing. Is that that you know that the real uh, human connection that you you get when you're meeting a person face to face. So mm -hmm. I think it heightened the awareness and heightened the importance that. Uh, human connections are really, really crucial because at the end of the day, we are human beings. We are social creatures, right? We don't live alone. Um, so I think if anything, the social distancing um, has made it even clearer to us that uh, it's important to pay attention to human connections. It's important to pay attention to how we are as individuals, who we are as individuals, how we are being as individuals, and how do we respect and regard other people who are working with us. Right, right. Okay, um, we... I, I think I want to take one last question from from the um, the crowd before we we call it the day a night mm -hmm. before, before we call it a night. So I, I yeah because Asel put this question. It, I I love his interaction with us today lah. So uh, that's one thing for sure. Um, it's, I think it's very important. He he wants to know what are what is one thing that we have we can take action of or either one of us have taken action that can help us now. Um, maybe I can take this question first. Yeah. So, uh, Asel, to address to this question, Tom, I can I can safely say that there are a lot of things that we can we can actually take action. Like I like if those people who are my friends on my Facebook, they they know that I I always like to do small little whining, you know. Uh, and and I just whined recently uh, about about me not really whine, but I said the government has not given me the 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 grants and the funds, you know, to to sustain the the SIRS funds. But what what can I do next? It's always thinking ahead, and that's why it's the rebound series that I call it, um, or the new norm that that um, parents call it. You know, it's looking forward, knowing what we can do for the near future. So for my company and for myself, there's there's already two things that I've done. I think upgrading, upgrading. We create a new we created a new opening for our our usual uh, opening series. Uh, for this and for our our stories, you know, um, and then getting new set of skills. That's another one. Get really, really, literally getting ready, knowing what is going to happen next. What is the new new changes? What what is going to happen? And then the third thing is getting leads, getting no, getting new uh, uh, potential partners, collaborators, clients that can that we can start to work with, knowing that once the cake breaker ends, we can start. Whether it is is it phase one, phase two, phase three? So we have something to look forward to. So when we have something to look forward to, then I think um, you know, we we can we can push through for the days lah. Yeah, there's some motivation behind. Yeah, so that's Very my answer to. You. Yeah. Very nice. So so my take is this right? Um, uh, we we all have different realities. Um, so we all you know have different backgrounds, different situations, different challenges. So there's no one. You know, real answer, right? But um, mm -hmm. for, uh, one thing that all of us can think, regardless of our realities, right, uh, is move forward, right? So it's about moving forward, whatever that means to each and every one of us, because we're all, you know, having different situations. So when I talk about moving forward, then how do I move forward, right? So I know that the, the current situation is not ideal, it's terrible, you know, there's all these challenges, and things that I don't like about it, you know, it's bringing me. Uh, bad news, da, da, da. okay, fine. So I've taken stock of my current reality and my current situation. Then the next thing to do really for me will be to think what is my big picture, right? What is the vision that I still have regardless of the current situation? So what is the vision uh, that I want to move forward to, right? So once I'm clear with that, 
uh, I then ask myself, what is the outcome that I want to see? So I think outcome is different from objective, right? So an objective would be, for example, um, to conduct a workshop. That is an objective. But an outcome would be the participants feel wonderful after the training. So that is an outcome. You see the difference? So I think for me, the outcome is very important. So at this point in time, it's really for me to take action to move forward is to be very clear what is the outcome that I want to see. So I have the vision, but I need to be very concrete in terms of what is the outcome that I want to see. And then the next thing to do then is really to talk to as many people to see what kind of resources or what ideas they have. I, of course, I need to come up with my own ideas, but uh, you know, ask around and see, this is my direction. This is where I want to go. What do you think? Right? This is the best time because everyone's stuck at home, right? So uh, you know, they're, uh, they're not flying, they're not in the plane. So it's a lot easier to just reach out to people. And just, hey, can you give me some ideas? This is where I think I want to go. Uh, what ideas do you have? And then finally, come up with an action plan. So, so the thing about action plan really is, uh, for me, is really putting down the steps, but uh, uh, you know, for me, is I like to incorporate changes as well, right? So if there's any uh, new scenarios, then I would incorporate. But it doesn't matter, right? The fact is you need to have an action plan and actually take action. So just having a dream or thinking about a vision or an idea, it's not good enough. Uh, mm. There has to be a very clear purpose and outcome. Uh, there has to be also support from people around me. So building a team and all that. But in the end, it's still really taking an action based on the action plan that I can so in summary, really, is move forward, right? And then below move forward is the vision, the outcomes, the plans, and then think about the people that I can uh, involve to help me move forward. This is exactly as, as what Fast said, taking the action, you know? She says, yeah. she wants to add on to, to what we have said, you know, what's important now? Take action based on my own response. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, wow. Well, Thank, thank you, Fast. We, we love your interaction with us as well. Fast is a very experienced, uh, you know, trainer, coach, uh, you know, uh, talent developer. So, so that's why wow. she shared uh, that perspective as well. So, thanks, Fast, for yeah. adding, getting to that. Yeah, we, we have the support. So, that means I should have Fast on live with us as oh, well, yeah, right? Yeah. I can certainly <laughs> connect the two of you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, it has been a, a wonderful night, a wonderful evening with uh, with all of you, uh, the viewers, and of course with Terence as well. So yes. Um, to end off for the night, um, except for good saying good night to them now. What is the one thing that uh, you would like to say to to our viewers? Yeah. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to you, Desmond, for setting this up. Uh, and then for inviting me to, to, you know, to be on your platform to share, uh, you know, my own personal experience as well as lessons learned. Um, and the next thing that I, I, I really want to share is, uh, is this maxim. I mean, I, I've got a lot of maxims, right? a lot of mottos, if you like, right? So like one phrase or something that, that I uh, tell myself. And uh, this particular phrase is called, uh, this too shall pass. Um, and it's something that I hold very dear. So um, I think a lot of us are in very difficult situation. Uh, at this point in time, but I think if we really believe, uh, you know, that this too shall pass, um, then we can find the courage, the inspiration and the hope for us to really chart the way forward and actually take action um, so that we are really always moving forward regardless of the kind of circumstances uh, that we are in. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you once again, and I would like to wish uh, everyone good health, uh, stay happy, stay strong, and uh, let's Let's uh, emerge stronger together. Yes, yes, emerge, emerge genetics, emerge stronger right. together. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, thank you, Terence, for our time. I mean, it's our really, really our great honor to uh, truly have you with us, uh, sharing so many things. I, I learned a lot today as well. Uh, I believe we will have our virtual coffee session real soon. Yeah. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good night to you, Terence. Thank you and good night. All right, good night, bye-bye. All right, yes, um, yeah, Asiel said, okay, bye, Asiel, okay, uh, don't go yet, don't just, just not yet. All right, so um, thank you all so much um, for staying with us. Uh, uh, I, I know it has been a long night, but we hope, we hope you like what you have heard uh, in the session with me and Terrence. So next week, next week on Wednesday, uh, on Wednesday, we are going to have 
a guest in the real estate and property industry. So he will be sharing with everyone on the current situation and how the property scene is actually evolving or nurturing into. I wouldn't use the word nurture, yeah, but evolving into. So there will be uh, a lot of technical sharing um, and, and how the, the, in the, the industry or the scene is actually changing. Uh, so do join us for the rebound. Um, next Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Successpedia Asia's Facebook and YouTube Live. So, yeah, so there you have Desmond here, your amateur host and facilitator, signing out.